Hello everyone, I'm Alex Dykes, and on this blustery day, we're out here taking a look at the 2014 Infiniti QX60 crossover. Now, this was formerly known as the JX35, but Infiniti decided to rename their entire lineup, going for Q and QX to differentiate between sedan and SUVs and crossovers. This particular model is the hybrid version, and this hybrid version costs $3,000 more than the base model QX60, but it does deliver 25% improved mileage. Now, you can think of the QX60 as sort of the luxury cousin to the Nissan Path, Finder. They are mechanically related even though they don't share all that many parts, especially on the outside or on the luxurious interior in our QX60. That means that this QX60 really does business with the rest of the luxury crossover segment, and I would define that as the Acura MDX, the Volvo XC90, which is getting a little bit old, and the Audi Q7, if you kind of stretch it up there a little bit. Well, this does also compete with base models of the Mercedes-Benz ML and the BMW X5. Those are a great deal more expensive. If you want to stretch things down market, you can also include the Buick Enclave. And logically, in this hybrid model, I would also include the Toyota Highlander Hybrid because it is a three-row crossover and it is fairly expensive in that hybrid trim. It's only a few thousand dollars cheaper than this QX60 when it's in hybrid trim. Keeping in mind that style is a very subjective and very personal thing, I want to know what you think about the look of the QX60 as well as the modern Infiniti lineup. Go ahead and let me know in that comment section down below. Overall, I actually like the design themes going on in these modern Infinities. I really like the hard and square lines that you'll find in Cadillac's current lineup, but I think that there is definitely room for these sexy flowing shapes in the market as well. This front end kind of reminds me of a large fish mouth. It looks like it's going to try and eat something, but I think that the design overall works very well in this three-row crossover. Our hybrid model is fully loaded, and that means that we do get the radar cruise control system with the all-around camera system. That's why we have this little camera right here under that Infinity logo. Everything is very well finished and very well hidden up front. Right here we have fog lights, front parking sensors, and our HID headlamps. Now you will find LED headlamps in the Acura MDX, and you'll also find them available in most of the German competitors. So that really does differentiate this a little bit. It's important to keep in mind that the QX60 does ring in a little bit less than those German counterparts, however, so you do get what you pay for. When Infiniti first started dabbling in crossovers, they introduced the world to the Infiniti FX. It had a very long hood, it was rear wheel drive, it very much looked like someone took their uh, Infiniti rear wheel drive sedan and then jammed a more practical box on the back end. It was very aggressive and very attractive. The QX60 is going for something kind of different here because this is a front wheel drive vehicle by default, which means we have very front wheel drive proportions. We have a relatively long front overhang, and then we have this very traditional crossover sort of SUV big box on the back end. We don't have those same proportions of very long hood and very short body that you get on the FX. Of course, the reason for that is all about cargo practicality because this is a three row crossover. It's not a two row sports crossover. And right back here, we have a relatively vertical hatch, which makes it a lot more practical for cargo. We also get a roof line that, although it does slope towards the rear, doesn't slope as aggressively as you'll find in certain other crossovers or SUVs out there. Now, this isn't the flattest or the straightest, and that really does compromise the rear headroom just a little bit in that third row. Designing an attractive rear end for a three-row crossover seems to be difficult. Manufacturers either give it a very sloping rear glass and then hope for the best, or they do something like the Chevy Traverse, where they just go with a very flat rear end, and then they don't really do a whole lot in terms of styling. They just glue on some lights and just call that a day. The QX60 isn't like that. Even though this is still relatively simple, I think I think it has a very classy and elegant look to it. We have chrome strips right here and down here above and below the license plate. Our particular model has these rear parking sensors and in the hybrid model our exhaust tip is completely hidden from the back. If you're planning on towing with your crossover then you should know that towing ratings for 2014 are actually up in the 3.5 liter V6 model to 5,000 pounds matching the Nissan Pathfinder and if you get the hybrid model then you can tow up to 3,500 pounds when your vehicle is properly equipped. Under the hood you'll find two different engines for 2014. Things start out with a 3.5 5 liter V6 engine. It produces 265 horsepower and 248 pound-feet of torque. Then we get this optional hybrid system that we're looking at right here. This is based on a 2.5 liter Atkinson cycle four-cylinder engine that has been supercharged. This is, to my knowledge, the first supercharged hybrid that I have ever driven. Uh, the supercharger adds 11 psi of boost, giving this 2.5 liter engine 230 horsepower and 243 pound-feet of torque all by itself. Now this is coupled to an electric motor good for about 20 horsepower, raising the system total up to 250 horsepower and 243 pound-feet combined. The reason the torque number isn't a little bit higher is because of the way the torque curve of the motor and the torque curve of the engine interact with one another. Now this is a pancake style hybrid system, which means we have the engine over here, then we have a clutch pack, and then we have a pancake motor that replaces the torque converter, then we have another clutch, 
and then we have a traditional CVT behind it. So this is not like the eCVT that you find in the Toyota hybrid systems, which is really an electromechanical hybrid power split device. It's very different than this. Now powering the electric motor is a 0.6 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery pack that's jammed right below the third row seats that is relatively small in the hybrid world. This is a decent amount smaller than you'll find in a lot of the other modern hybrids out there. Fuel economy for the V6 model comes in at 20 miles per gallon city, 26 highway, and 22 miles per gallon combined thanks to the CVT. If you add the optional all-wheel drive system, that does reduce your numbers by about one mile per gallon. Now versus the Nissan Pathfinder, this all-wheel drive system is a little bit different because the Pathfinder will disable the all-wheel drive system on most driving situations, uh, depending on how you have the little selector knob right there in the center console set. This vehicle, the all-wheel drive system is always on, which is a little bit more fitting to a luxury vehicle. Now, if you opt for the hybrid system, it does increase the fuel economy to 26 miles per gallon city, 28 on the highway, with a combined rating of 26 miles per gallon. Again, if you get the all-wheel drive system, it cuts things by about one mile per gallon across the board. If you want to know more about how this hybrid system works, then go ahead and click that banner at the bottom of your screen, or you can wait till the end of the video, and there'll be a link to take you on over to a video specifically about the Nissan and Infiniti hybrid system. Front seat comfort comes in at seven out of 10 points. We have a two-way adjustable lumbar support, two position power memory on the driver's seat, but this passenger seat isn't quite as adjustable as the driver's seat. We do have this four-way power and memory linked tilt telescopic steering column with a decent range of motion. One important thing to keep in mind about the seven out of 10 points when it comes to the QX60 is that I'm not comparing this to something like a Toyota Highlander. The Toyota Highlander does score below this in terms of comfort. In this category, the QX60 gets compared with something like a BMW X5, and the X5 has some really incredibly comfortable seats. The base seats in the X5 do have more adjustability than this base seat right here. The passenger seat in the X5 also has the same amount of adjustability as the driver. And you can also get a 21-way adjusting seat in that X5 that contorts in a million different directions and has an awful lot of adjustability that you just don't find in something like this QX60 or the Acura MDX. Speaking of the MDX, I do rate these seats about the same as that MDX. They're just a little bit less comfortable than the XC90. Rear seat comfort, of course, depends on which row you're in. Right here in the second row, we get eight out of 10 points. Now, these seat bottom cushions are a little bit close to the floor for my tastes, but children should find them a little bit more comfortable than adults. I do have a reasonable amount of headroom here in the second row. I have about an inch left. Now, our model is equipped with this optional large panoramic sunroof right here that covers the third and the second row, and that does reduce your headroom a little bit. So do keep that in mind before you select that option. The second row seat reclines and it moves forward and backward. And uh, if I move out of this seat, you can see that the second row also folds completely flat to help in your cargo loading. Now, an important consideration with this vehicle is that this 40 side of the 60-40 folding seat allows you to have a child seat buckled in there with the latch anchors and move the seat forward so you can get into the third row. Now, this feature is exclusive to the QX60 and the Nissan Pathfinder at the time this video was made. If you do know of anything out there that's also able to do that, be sure and comment in the comment section down below. I also encourage you to click that link at the bottom of this video and you can be taken on over to the child seat video where I talk about how child seats interact with the QX60. Getting in and out of the third row is relatively easy because the second row slides quite far forward and the way the seat articulates, you have a decent amount of room right here to get in and out of the third row. That's facilitated by these seat rails that are on the floor. They do stick up a little bit higher and they go a little bit further forward than you find in a lot of three row SUVs. And that's just because of the way these seats move. Let's take a look at that entry and the exit from this other side now. The seat does move in exactly the same manner. Or if you have a child seat inserted in this seat, instead of the seat bottom cushion flipping up, it actually moves down like that. And then the whole seat moves forward. That's what allows you to use the child seat and as you can see, I have a relatively smaller amount of ingress and egress room there, but it's still more than adequate to get in the third row. Now the third row is quite cramped if this second row seat is moved all the way back. However, if I adjust the front seat for myself, and then if I adjust the second row seat for myself, now this vehicle is a little bit longer than some of the competition, which is why we have a little bit more third row leg room back here. Now the seat bottom cushion is a little bit close to the floor and rather unfortunately in our sunroof equipped model, again, this does have the dual panoramic sunroof, I don't really have any headroom going on back here. My head is touching the ceiling and I do have to cock it slightly to one side in order to fit back here. But there is a little bit more room back here than you'll find in some of those other three row options. As you'd expect, the third row does fold. Move the headrest there first and then the seat back folds completely flat with the cargo area. And uh, this second row also folds completely flat with the cargo area, really making it a lot easier to put large items in the QX60. If I can actually do this from the inside, sort of like an acrobatic act to do this from the third row. 
There we go. Let's take a quick spin around the interior. As you can see, we have height adjustable seat belts for both the first and the second row of passengers. So you'll find those right there in the front as well. Since our particular model has the optional rear seat entertainment system, we do have this enormous headrest right here, which I find a little bit less comfortable than the model without the rear seat entertainment system. Now, because of the way options are packaged on the QX60, you will find this sunroof on a decent number of models right out there on the lot because it's the only way to get certain options in the QX60. This is part of the deluxe tech package and it's a really long list. Let me read it to you here. So if any of those things are on your must have list, then you do need to know that rear seat headroom will be compromised because you will get this panoramic sunroof with those. If we open up the glove box, we do find an extraordinarily large glove box right here. There's an additional shelf right on top for the owner's manual for the vehicle. And we were easily able to put large tablet computers right there in that glove box. Now, because ours is the fully loaded model with the optional leather package, we have these very soft brown leather seats with infinity stitching right here. Ours are cooled, so we get this perforated leather section right there in the middle of the seat. The doors are all covered in soft touch plastics. We have a soft touch armrest right here and soft touch upper. And part of this leather package that gives you the brown leather seats also includes real maple trim right there on the dashboard and on the front doors. That really separates this from something like an Acura MDX, which has fake wood in the United States. You can get that Acura with real wood in Canada, but not in the US. Moving over to the dashboard, we have a combination of hard and soft touch plastics. The dashboard upper is hard and these side portions are all soft. We have our large infotainment and navigation screen, two large air vents right here, climate controls, and the buttons for this navigation system. While other manufacturers have started to include all-around view cameras on their vehicles, a Nissan has taken the all-around camera to the mainstream with something like a Nissan Versa Note. The Infinity products are really where all-around cameras shine. Part of that, of course, has to do with this large high-resolution touchscreen right here in the dashboard, slightly nicer cameras in the Infinities than you find in the other vehicles. But we also get nice touches like parking sensors with moving object detection. We have these lines that tell us where the vehicle is going to go if we turn the steering wheel. And that's true whether we're in drive with this camera on or whether we're in reverse. So this line right here will tell you where the front wheels are going, where the rear wheels are going. We can change the view yet again. We can get a side view of the car and you can really see where that tire is right there. So if we're trying to back in or out of a particular spot, you can really see where the front of the car is going in these views. It really makes navigating around this relatively tight parking area in this park very easy. I can see if I'm uh, going to fall off this curb right here very easily. You can switch over to the all around camera view, which is sort of like a uh, bird's eye view over the vehicle. And you can see really how, uh, how the car is interacting with this parking space right here. Now, rather unfortunately, this nifty camera system is not standard in the QX60. It is part of an option package, but this is an option package that I would definitely get. Now, the QX60 does not come standard with the navigation and infotainment system, but our particular model does have that. If you want to know more about it, then go ahead and click that banner at the bottom of your screen. Right below that, we have the buttons for our climate control system. We have this button and knob and dial arrangement that control that screen. Keyless go button right here. And here is where you'll find the slot player for the optical disk drive in our particular system, volume knob, forward, backward button, preset buttons, random, etc. Below those controls, we have a large cubby right here where you can store your knickknacks. We have two very large drink holders. Those do close with another matching maple cover right there. And then we have our traditional gear shift right here. Behind the gear shifter, we have our drive mode selector, sport, regular, eco, and snow mode. This controls the all wheel drive system as well as the eco pedal and transmission programming. Our model has the optional heated and cooled seats. Behind those controls, we have a very large and softly padded center armrest. It is a two stage opening unit. So right here, there's the first compartment, which is relatively shallow for phones and wallets. And then that opens to reveal a much larger second compartment. Right here, these are the headphones for that rear seat entertainment system. We have our audio video input for the rear seat entertainment system, an additional power port, USB and auxiliary input, and then relatively large storage cubby for whatever it is you want to stick back in there. On the driver's side, we have our tachometer over here. We have our power gauge right below that. Charge on this side, boost on that side. Over there, we have our speedometer and we also have our fuel gauge. We do have an engine temperature gauge in this multifunction display right here, so we can move over to that. And right here we have our engine temperature, vehicle warnings, vehicle settings. We can move back on over to our safety system interaction. That shows what safety systems are active right on the vehicle because I'm in snow mode. That's not active, but there we go. We can turn on our, our all of our various electronic systems, which we'll go over later in the video right there. Uh, we have our hybrid status. We also have our eco pedal display gauge. You can see right here how hard you're pressing on the pedal and whether the car thinks that's appropriate or not. And if we move on over, we can see our average fuel economy. 
we have been doing a decent amount of idling right now, so that has dropped the fuel economy of this vehicle. Moving out to the steering wheel, this button arrangement right here on the left of the steering wheel controls not only that multi-information display, but also controls the navigation and infotainment display right there in the center console. Track, up and down button, enter button. This also allows you to select between the options. We have a back button, and then this button changes between the screens right there in that multi-information display. We have our radar cruise control buttons right over here. Our vehicle does have the optional radar assist system. We have our radio controls right down here, volume up, down, source, voice command, phone button right there. And over on this side, we have our cruise control on off button. And this button right here turns on and off the dynamic safety systems that your vehicle may or may not be equipped with. Ours has all of those safety systems, pre-collision warning, blind spot warning, blind spot intervention, etc. And you can activate and deactivate uh, the intervention port of those systems uh, with this little button right there. To the driver's left, we have our usual bevy of buttons right over here. We have our window switches, our power folding side view mirrors. But right down here on this bank of buttons down here is where you turn off the notification system. So the collision notification, the blind spot notification, that's where you turn that off right there. And then we also have our heated steering wheel button right down there as well. When it comes to cargo hauling, the size of the QX60 really pays dividends. Right here, I have a 26 inch roller bag and a 24 inch roller bag. As you can see, they don't quite fit side by side right back here in the cargo area. And this is behind the third row seat with the third row seat in place. However, you can fit four of these 24 inch roller bags. This is the largest size you can carry on a domestic flight. You can fit four of them very easily right back here and close this cargo hatch. And as I discovered, you can also fit two average sized convertible child seats back here. Now this is an awful lot more room than you'd find in the back of your average three row crossover. However, if you do need to carry six people and six people's worth of luggage, then you're gonna need to find something bigger. With the bags removed, we have some additional storage room right under the cargo load floor. It's not too big because in our particular model, we do have the Bose subwoofer right here. So it does eat up some of that underfloor storage space. We have little bag clips right here on the back of the third row and on the side of the cargo compartment. And we also have a 12 volt power port right over here on the side. Overall, this means that the QX60 scores eight out of 10 points when it comes to our trunk comfort index because I can actually fit right back here in the cargo area. Let's start off this review by hopping on the freeway. I give this vehicle six out of 10 points when it comes to acceleration. This actually accelerates better than the regular QX60 because we get some extra torque out of this hybrid system than you do out of that 3.5 liter V6 in the regular Q60. That results in a zero to 60 time just over seven seconds. Now just over seven seconds is a good acceleration time. However, the QX60 does play in the luxury crossover and SUV pool, and there are some significantly faster options out there. So while I do think seven seconds is perfectly fine for zero to 60 times, it's definitely a little bit slower than you'll find out of the V8 competition from Mercedes and BMW. A quick note on this transmission. As I said earlier, this is a traditional belt and pulley style CVT transmission with an electric motor attached and not a hybrid power split device or an eCVT like you'd find in the Toyota Highlander Hybrid or the Lexus RX 450H. And the result is this feels more like a traditional CVT transmission. So the gear ratio shifts are a little bit more uh, lengthy than you'd find in the eCVT in those Toyota and Lexus hybrids. However, the hybrid system in this vehicle, the addition of that clutch pack really removes an awful lot of the transmission feel complaints that people tend to complain about when it comes to CVTs. People normally complain about a rubber bandy kind of feel, that's what they usually call it. And that feeling is caused by the way the transmission varies its ratios. So if you accelerate and then you lift your foot off the accelerator, it feels like the vehicle continues to accelerate for just a little bit as the vehicle uh, lowers its RPMs of the engine. That doesn't happen in this vehicle because the vehicle can disconnect the clutch pack and improve the feel of the transmission. Now we're out on the highway here first because this is a very good place to demonstrate Infinity's active safety systems. Infinity's safety systems are very aggressive and they're also very interactive when you compare them to other luxury players. Mercedes and Volvo have very advanced safety systems and they do many of the same things that this Infiniti QX60 can do. However, Mercedes and Volvo seem to prefer intervention at the last minute. You can think of them as disaster mitigation systems, not disaster prevention systems. The notification side of these safety systems can be enabled or disabled via a button to the left of the steering wheel that I showed you earlier. The action side of the system can be enabled and disabled via a button on the steering wheel. So it allows you to enable it and disable it whenever you want to. If you, for instance, wanted to drive aggressively and weave in and out of traffic and you didn't want the system to interact with you, then you can disable it temporarily and re-enable it. You can also select which portions of these systems you want enabled or disabled at any moment via the vehicle settings menus. I said earlier that these systems are more interactive and more aggressive than the competition. What I mean by that is if you take a look at the Volvo systems and the Lincoln systems, they will alert you as soon as the vehicle thinks that a collision might happen. 
Rather than doing that solely in this vehicle, this vehicle will actually take action against this situation. So right now I'm coming upon this vehicle up in front of me, and the first thing this vehicle does is it actually pushes the accelerator pedal back up at me, at my foot, so that way it lifts the accelerator pedal up so I'm not accelerating quite as quickly. And then as soon as I pull my foot off this brake pedal, the dynamic collision avoidance system actually applies the brakes for me, even though I don't have the radar cruise control activated on this car. It will apply them fairly aggressively, as well as alert me to a possible accident. The ecosystem in the QX60 Hybrid, like most of the other Infinities that have an eco pedal, is actually tied to the accelerator pedal itself. So if I'm driving in an eco-unfriendly manner, the accelerator pedal will provide more resistance to my foot. I can still floor it if I want to, I can still press it all the way down, but the pedal's going to fight back just a little bit. The same thing goes for the lane departure warning system. If I'm going to cross this lane line right here, the system will actually try and steer me back in the lane line. Now rather than some of Ford's latest systems or Mercedes system where it actually turns the steering wheel for you, the Infinity system still uses a brake actuated system. So it applies the brakes on one side of the vehicle to sort of torque vector you back in the lane. You do feel the brakes come on just a little bit in this style of system, but it's just as good at steering you back in the lane line. Infinity system will do the same thing if there's something in your blind spot. So right now there's somebody in my blind spot right over there. I can tell because there's a little blind spot indicator on the car. If I turn on my turn signal, the car will beep at me and flash that light to tell me that there's somebody in the blind spot. And if I tried to turn into them, this car will do the same thing as the lane departure system and will try and steer me back in my lane to try and prevent me from hitting that person. This slow and go traffic is the perfect place to talk about fuel economy. I give this vehicle a 10 out of 10 points when it comes to fuel economy because this is quite simply the most efficient three row gasoline powered luxury crossover vehicle. I know that is kind of splitting hairs a little bit, but even if we broaden this out to your regular three row crossover vehicles, it still scores about nine out of 10 points, just slightly below the Toyota Highlander Hybrid. The Highlander Hybrid is a relatively expensive mainline crossover vehicle, so I do see it being cross shopped with something like this QX60 in the real world. In the real world, that vehicle gets about four or five miles per gallon better fuel economy than this QX60 hybrid in real world driving. The reason for that is this QX60 has a relatively small battery, a relatively less powerful motor. It's really only good for about 15 horsepower or so. And the climate control system in this vehicle is all engine powered. So the AC compressor is engine powered, it's not electric. That means that as I'm driving along this freeway here, the engine is running this entire time because it's trying to keep the cabin cool. This is very different than the other Infiniti hybrids. The Q50 and the Q70 hybrid are much more aggressive at engine start stop because they have a much more powerful motor. It's almost 70 horsepower in those two vehicles and they have an electric air conditioning compressor, which means those vehicles can idle and run the air conditioning. Now you're probably wondering about those diesel options out there. Well, it's true that the BMW X5 diesel will get about two to three miles per gallon better fuel economy than this QX60 hybrid, but it's gonna cost you $11,500 more than the QX60 and diesel's more expensive. Right here in California, it's about 40 cents a gallon more expensive than the fuel I've been feeding this QX60. So you do have to factor that into your fuel economy estimates. Compared to the ML350 diesel and the Audi Q7 TDI, they're still a decent amount more expensive than this. They're between $6,600 and $7,600 more than this, and diesel's more expensive, and they get about the same fuel economy as this. So while they do get better fuel economy than their regular V6 gasoline version, the fuel economy is only about as good as this QX60 hybrid, but they drink more expensive fuel. Much like the regular QX60, the hybrid model is an excellent highway cruiser. I give this 10 out of 10 points when it comes to the ride. This is very compliant, it's very comfortable. These are very comfortable seats. And we score nine out of 10 points when it comes to cabin noise. This is a very hushed cabin. Overall, I give this about six out of 10 points when it comes to handling. Something like a BMW X5 or an Acura MDX, they are gonna handle considerably better than this QX60. The QX60 isn't a bad handler by any stretch of the imagination, however. Let me get that out of the way right away. But when you compare it to the rest of this luxury segment, it is dominated by excellent handling vehicles. If you take a look at the BMW X5, it has incredibly wide tires, it's very well sorted. It also has a strong rear wheel drive bias to that vehicle. And so it's going to handle a decent amount better than this QX60. The same thing goes for braking. I give this seven out of 10 points. It isn't as sure-footed and the stopping distances are definitely longer than the Germans. However, this is still very good. So if you're comparing this to your average mid-sized crossover, it's going to perform better than those average mid-sized crossovers, but it's not going to perform quite as well as those other luxury entries. 
Out on the road, the hybrid trim of the QX60 is definitely the best version of this vehicle available, and I would strongly recommend getting this over the 3.5 liter V6. We have a little bit more torque, which results in slightly better performance out on the road. I think the drivability of this is actually improved versus the non-hybrid model. We get a lot more low-end torque. We actually get a slightly faster 0 to 60 time. The engine doesn't have to rev up as much when you're hill climbing. Even though we do have a four-cylinder noise coming from under the hood, it is very well hushed, but it is still a four-cylinder noise. You actually get less engine noise in this than you get in the 3.5 liter V6 because this engine doesn't have to rev as high to climb hills as that 3.5 liter V6 and you can thank the supercharger for that. Infinity has set the price for the 2014 model year starting at $42,100 for the V6 equipped model and $45,100 for the hybrid equipped model. According to Infinity, you will recoup that cost in just over three years because they claim this vehicle will save you about $900 a year in fuel cost. However, based on my average fuel economy of 20.7 miles per gallon in the V6 model and 24.5 miles per gallon in this hybrid model, I estimate it will really take you about six years to break even. When it comes to value, I give the QX60 8 out of 10 points in the V6 version and 9 out of 10 points in the hybrid version. Even though this is a relatively mild hybrid system and it didn't operate in EV mode as long as I would have liked, it still represents a decent value when you compare it to the competition. That Acura MDX starts at about $42,290 and ends up just about as expensive as this QX60 Hybrid, but we do get better fuel economy in the QX60 Hybrid. The Lincoln MKT is relatively similarly priced. The Volvo XC90 is a decent amount cheaper, but it's an awful lot older. And if you're taking a look at this versus the German competition, the X5, the Q7, as well as the Mercedes ML, then they are going to be considerably more expensive. If you are concerned about operating costs, then the QX60 also makes a decent amount of sense because this doesn't cost that much more to operate than your average luxury two-row crossover. Because everybody on Facebook has been asking me about this versus the Toyota Highlander Hybrid, let's talk about that. The Toyota Highlander Hybrid is a mass market vehicle with a mass market brand name. It's uh, the most expensive trim of a vehicle that doesn't really start that much over $20,000. Whereas this is a hybrid version of a vehicle that only costs about $3,000 more than its base price. It's uh, near nearly twice as expensive as that base priced Highlander. Aside from that obvious branding question, I think that the hybrid system in the Highlander Hybrid is superior to this one. You can operate at higher EV speeds, you can operate in EV mode longer. It also delivers better fuel economy than you get out of this QX60 Hybrid. However, the QX60 is just a better vehicle in general aside from the hybrid system than that Highlander. We have a more comfortable third row seat, more comfortable seating all the way around. We do again have that luxury brand name, but aside from that we also have the luxury trappings that you expect with that luxury branding. We have uh, better leather, we have real wood trim on the inside, we have luxury features that you don't find in that Highlander, and we also have some practical features that you don't find in the Highlander as well, like this second row seat that allows you to keep a child seat bolted into the seat and recline it forward so you can get into the back seat more easily. You can't do that in a Highlander. So even as far as practical families go, if you're looking for a family vehicle and you're considering that Toyota Highlander Hybrid, then something like this is actually a solid alternative. Versus the MDX, that's a trickier question. It really depends on what you're after. That may sound like a little bit of a cop-out, but it's true. The MDX is by far the sportier option. It has a slightly stiffer ride. It seems to be more sport-oriented. Definitely handles considerably better than this vehicle. It also has Acura's super handling all-wheel drive system with a torque vectoring rear axle, and that's not something you can find on this QX60 at any price. The QX60 delivers a more polished highway ride. We have real wood trim on the inside. It's definitely more luxury oriented. So if you're after a soft and comfortable highway cruiser, then this is the vehicle for you. If you're after more of a corner carving BMW X5 competitor, then that would really be the Acura MDX. The Acura MDX does compete very well in terms of handling with the BMW X5 uh, with the three liter turbo engine in that BMW X5, really in that base trim. I mean, if you start hiking your way up into the BMW X5 with the twin turbo V8, then none of these competitors in this particular segment that the QX60 plays in will really compete directly with that BMW. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video. Again, I'm Alex Dykes, and this has been the 2014 QX60 Hybrid. Go ahead and click that subscribe banner at the bottom of your screen so you can be updated on all of my latest videos. You can go ahead and find me over at facebook.com slash alexandautos. Send your emailed questions to alex at alexandautos.com, and I'll see you next week.